really I'm excited uh, for this conversation. Professor Kritzinger, as you might know, um, is currently a Meritus Professor um, in Missiology at, at uh, UNISA, um, but also formerly uh, the Dean of, of the Faculty of Religion and Theology at UNISA. Uh, Prof. Kritzinger also um, served for many years as the the head of uh, yeah I say the head of the Northern Theological Seminary the the, the chair of the Seminary Management Committee um, and uh, leading and guiding the seminary He's still involved with the seminary I I recently saw him teaching as well at the seminary I don't know if he's still the chair of of the Seminary Management Committee but um, but still teaching. Um, and uh, wonderful. Um, if I may, Klippis turned 70 this year. Um, we celebrated his, his, his um, 70th birthday in Ru Romania uh, early in this year. And uh, it, it is a wonderful privilege, Klippis, to have you here with us today. Now, colleagues, um, as you know, the conversation is informal, um, but also we want to uh, open up a, a dialogue a dialogue as we grapple in particular today with with this theme what are the lessons that that we've learned this year and uh Klippis will share some of the lessons that he has learned i i know him as someone who uh is a lifelong learner um intrigued and curious about about new things and i can imagine even for him this year might have been a, a year of of growth a year of of um, being challenged um so uh, and and then of course linked to that question is how will that uh, also impact our work as theologians? Um, uh, perhaps the way that we think, uh, the way that we do our work, um, and uh, also in a sense pro projecting uh, the future. I've all again asked uh, Dr. Shanto Weber to um, uh, to uh, after Prof. Klippis have spoken. Uh, uh, to to give a bit of a reflection, uh, what what have she heard over the last few weeks? We've reflecting reflected on this. What what is it that we are hearing, um, colleagues? Um, and and then also uh, uh, what what are kind of themes that 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 we can take with? Perhaps also pose questions uh, to to us um, and and so, sort of stimulating the uh, the the conversation. So. Uh, Klippis, it is now sort of five minutes past 12. Um, you have about uh, 10, 15 minutes. Um, it's, it's quite flexible um, to, to start the conversation. Uh, we, will, we will listen and colleagues, uh, please, if you want to make comments in the, in the chat function, feel free to do so. Um, if you want to ask questions, uh, feel free to do so. We are recording this, so um, ideally, uh, we would want to capture your questions and the conversation also so that we are able to, um, to also put it later perhaps on, on, on YouTube. So, Klippis, uh, I'm going to give over to you. You've got the, the platform and, and we, we will continue this dialogue. Over to you. Uh, thank you very much, Reggie. It's a real privilege. Also a little bit daunting. Um, I, I imagine that um, episode four, you've you've listened to a number of people already, and uh, I'm really not sure to what extent I've really got something new to say. But l let me let me talk about uh, some impressions that this year has made on me, theologically, but also in terms of church and ministry. The, the first one is a, is sort of a paradox um, of, on the one hand, human fragility and on the other hand, human excellence and expertise, um, or maybe the, the paradox of vulnerability and power. Uh, those two things seem to have um, surfaced very clearly at the same time. We are helpless as humanity against a tiny little piece of protein. It's not even a living being, this virus. It's just a little scrap of protein that, that can destroy a person's life. Uh, human fragility and mortality. At the same time, amazing scientific expertise. Within days and weeks, this virus was 
photographed and identified and isolated and traced and uh, vaccine development started and advice on how to treat patients. So I'm, I'm struck by this amazing doubleness of, of human nature and of human society. On the one hand, we are vulnerable victims of, uh, of viruses uh, which come to us from animals, our contact with animals, our contact with the earth. So our deeply rooted earthiness as human beings, which exposes us to all sorts of dangers that we're not even aware of, and that suddenly explode on us. And then our, the other side, this amazing, innovative, scientific, modern, modernist uh, power to, to fight back, to claw back, and to not accept our fragility. But so together with, with the health challenges, and of course, HIV and, T and TB sadly get terribly neglected and uh, uh, lost, left out in the process, and many people are dying unnecessarily of, of other diseases because all the focus is on COVID. So you, you, you also wonder whether our fragility and our excellence, whether we've got the right balance, or not the balance, the right integration between the two, are we not overemphasizing the one at the expense of the others? But along with regional wars and conflicts, with global refugees, with, with raising Trumpism, um, authoritarian dictatorships across different societies in the world, Black Lives Matter, the, uh, the highlighting of racial difference and racial oppression and gender-based violence and hurricanes, and global warming and the melting of glaciers, political corruption, in this country and elsewhere. All of this together, for me, has created a, I think, a general sense of crisis for humanity. So, so what, 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 what are we on about? What, what, what is life all about? This, of course, is fertile ground for conspiracy theories, but also for ap apocalyptic, way out, weird faiths that, that, that sort of go along with that suspicion of authority and suspicion of expertise. Um, but I think it forced me, and I mean, I've said this some years ago already, that I become more attracted to the apocalyptic strand in the Christian tradition. The one that says, do not put your trust in princes. Do not trust the governments, do not trust the politicians and the economists and the scientists in the final analysis. We have to trust them, but don't put your life on them. Don't put your money on them. So, so that relationship between science and faith, between politics and faith, between economics and faith, um, I'm, I'm pushed more into sort of a pre-Constantinian apocalyptic tradition of saying, well, it's night, but the day is coming, the day is dawning, and we are the children of light, and we are the children of the future. Uh, and that sort of ur-Christian um, um, apocalyptic um, dramatized in baptism of turning away from darkness and turning to the light and living into the light um, as our only source of hope in an extremely confusing world. So more countercultural, undermining, resistant Christianity, not going with the stream, not flowing with the, you know, running with the dogs. But um, I, I sense and I experience a call to small committed communities of faith with the importance of personal discipleship. You cannot trust, you cannot float along on the, the big worshiping congregation anymore. That, that does not sustain your faith. You can't even get there. So the importance of personal discipleship and, and growth. Now, early on in the, in the year, Matthew 10, verse 16, uh, struck me particularly the idea that Jesus said, we are like sheep among wolves. We, uh, we're very vulnerable. We have to be extremely careful like snakes, while at the same time innocent as doves. It's a, a mission text that I've never really taken very seriously, but it stood out for me as a sort of a red letter uh, text this year. But that's sort of the one thing generally. But then I think the sidelining of the church struck me this year, as particularly its caring and healing ministry. 
the medical science scientists have taken center stage. We listen to them, we have to listen to them. But the presence of the priest, the pastor at the bedside of a sick patient, of a dying patient was, was gone. So the church has been sidelined and the expert is no longer the priest with his or her rituals, but the scientist with his medication and uh, with oxygen. And then the, the power of the government enforcing lockdowns. So the, the scientific community and the, so the political community have taken over. And it seems to me, and we'll have to see what huge secularizing effect this has on the community as a whole. Um, I think the, the, the bubonic plagues and huge earthquakes uh, in, in Europe have over the, over the centuries created a great deal of secularizing and agnosticism or atheism that people say, well, so where is God in all this? Or where is, what, is this what is the sense of the church in all this? I think the, the health and wealth churches um, have probably lost more credibility than the, the more sedate, uh, liberal, uh, liberal in the, in the descriptive sense of the word, churches like Presbyterians and Reformed and Methodists who, uh, who don't promise people health and, 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 and wealth, who are more pastoral and, uh, you know, more serenity prayer type of churches. Rather, I, I don't know how, I heard Julius Malema say, so where, where's these pastors who, who promise us healing? Where are they now? You know, they've been banned from the hospitals. They've been banned. From, do they still have any, any wares to sell, any product to, to, to push? So the sidelining of the church has been painful and in a sense, I think, creative and healing. But we, we'll have to see and we'll have to try and help ourselves as churches to, to face and recover through the rest of the pandemic to, to the other side. Part of that is weakening the church's finances, of course. Most congregations, if not all congregations, have taken a drop in income from tithing and offerings. And I think a, a huge challenge for us is the question, are there going to be many full-time ministers left in the church? Yes, there will be um, of the really big, successful, um, wealthy uh, communities. But I think in many, many congregations, particularly in townships and villages, there are going to be very few full-time ministers left. I hope I'm proven wrong. But so there will be more tent-making or self-supporting ministers. I think the church has been democratized in, in a number of ways, in my limited experience in this part time, uh, this, this time, more fellow members helping each other, encouraging each other on WhatsApp, less dependent on the pastor. Uh, the shepherding isn't by the, the, the main shepherd, but by one another. Um, that has been a very positive response, I think, um, to, to the crisis. But let me stop with or conclude with ministerial formation. Um, should we, can we still afford to um, form and shape ministers, theological students for full-time ministry? Can that still be, is it a responsible view to still, to, to still raise the expectation for young people coming from school and saying the Lord has called me to the ministry? To raise the expectation that they will be full-time ministers? Um, maybe we need to rethink our curriculum in a far more fundamental way that we, we are forming and shaping community workers who will have a strong theological insight and, and commitment, but who will be primarily teachers or development workers or nurses or uh, any, any other community work where you can earn a, a living when the, commun the, the church community is not able to pay you a salary with which you can support your family and send your children to school and university. So it raises all sorts of class questions. Is the church just a middle class phenomenon? So that, and there will be lots and lots of congregations who can continue in middle class patterns. Um, but even before COVID, there were lots of other congregations who were certainly uh, not uh, in that, in that category in that class and the, the COVID virus but also the lockdown 
and the economic downturn caused by that has, has created a completely new economic situation. Churches stepped up and shared a lot of parcels and food and, and money with fellow members who were suffering with lost their jobs. But there's also millions out there, not maybe even actively involved in churches, um, who are going through extreme poverty and, and pain and insecurity. And so what kind of ministerial formation does Stellenbosch, the Faculty of Theology, do, or UNISA, or our seminary, NTS? What, what, what should be our priorities now? It should be a, a biblical, a deep biblical foundation. It should be deeply African, I think African languages, which I would, and with which I and include Afrikaans, would have to be highlighted and, and mainstreamed and centered so that we, we deepen our contextual uh, rootedness. We don't depend on outsiders. We don't, we, we, we produce our own theological reflection on which, where are we going? Where should we be going? Look, th these are just a few very loose comments. And uh, I see that, oh, that was already 12 minutes. So it's just about time to stop. Thank you. A mouthful and uh, a lot of things that, that I would like to explore deeper and, and uh, some of the comments that you've made, but I'm sure in our conversation today, we, we might be able to also um, explore some of the things that, that you've raised. Thanks thanks for that, that introduction. Uh, Dr. Chantal Weber, I, I see you, you have joined us. I saw you in the lobby. Um, uh, it's over to you. Sure, thank you so much, uh, Prof. I, I didn't expect you to stop there, man. You could have carried on. Um, thank you for being with us, and it's an honor just to uh, reflect on some of your words. I must say, I was, um, yeah, as you were speaking, um, uh, two things came to mind. So last week we had Prof. Nico Koopman join us, and he also highlighted this, this notion of our human fragility. Um, and then holding that intention with the call to promote human dignity in everyone. And that's as colleagues, as staff, and even within the students who are struggling with this new modality. So that was quite interesting to see uh, you pick up again. But then also, as you were speaking, I, I immediately started thinking about prophetic imagination, you know, uh, that our... Uh, scholar Walter Brueggemann calls us to, you know, he speaks about, um, I just think about the quote, the task of prophetic ministry is to nurture, nourish, and evoke a consciousness and perception alternative to the consciousness and perception of the dominant culture around us. And, and as you were speaking about this tension, we could also say intersectionality of science and faith, politics and faith, um, church as conforming, but yet transforming, uh, and then also the tension between the natural uh, and what medical and science and all that is speaking to, and then also spiritual, our call to be prophetic witness uh, in, in these times. So I was thinking, I'm just sharing what I was thinking about as you were speaking, and um, again, something that resonates with what we've been hearing throughout this year has been a reminder to as a call to be church um, the being of church and so that connects to even your question around full-time ministry i i started writing yeah what would the impact of that be on how we uh, theologically train the next generation of ministers um one of the colleagues within the social justice space also posted on Facebook yesterday, uh, basically saying, can we still be asking poor colored and black young people to avail themselves for year of your life programs or internship programs when they live in context of poverty? You know, is it fair to even ask them to, to commit a year of their life to ministerial programs when they have mouths to feed and so forth. So um, really just resonance with what you were saying. 
And also, I think we've always had the tension of how relevant our theological training is, the whole decolonization discussion. Uh, so you remind us again to think about what that could look like, um, even in terms of what we're teaching. Um, your, your call for biblical fo foundation as key, um, assuming that our students are coming straight out of school. Uh, I put on my youth work hat. It aligns very closely to the fact that uh, our research shows that biblical illiteracy is key uh, among young people in South Africa, not just internationally. And so how do we then offer theological training that has that as a foundation, which you call us to? And yes, of course, um, yeah, languages, we're still very far from, from that. So um, I think I will just end off by asking the very same question for myself, uh, that which I asked Prof. Uh, Kupman last week, um, as we, we're trying to hold this tension, this intersectionality together, how do we prepare for an upcoming season of rest as academics? Thank you so much, uh, Prof. Uh, now. Well, thank you, thank you, uh, Chantal. Uh, Klippis, uh, back to you, um, uh, maybe some responses on, on, on some of the uh, points that Chantal highlighted, as well as uh, perhaps uh, the question. Um, um, yeah, Oof, thank you, Chantal. Um, how do we prepare? Let me start there. How do we prepare for rest? Um, it's it's going to be, in a way, difficult to switch off. I, I found it difficult to write this year. Some people flourished and wrote lots and lots of things. Uh, I was called upon to preach more than I normally preach and uh, do sort of a bit of reflections and things like that. And so I... I have a feeling of a little bit of unease with myself that I wasn't able to to write more. Uh, so with that sort of guilt, not guilt, but dissatisfaction in the back of your mind, it's hard then to, to switch off and rest. But I think we need to probably forgive ourselves. And uh, so this has been an absolutely unique and unprecedented year. And that we shouldn't, as the Americans say, beat ourselves up too much on what we didn't achieve. And therefore, actually, say we live by grace and let's let's enter into a little bit of that Sabbath rest that Hebrews talks about, anticipating the, uh, the full coming of the reign of God. Um, and yeah, in the end, we struggle with ourselves, I think, more than with anyone else also as theologians and as ministers and as believers. But it, uh, we, we, need to, we, we need to rest. We, we're going to need a, a lot of energy and imagination, prophetic and otherwise, for next year. So if we don't switch off and just do other things and read storybooks and novels and get into, into nature if we can and just... We, we, we're going to do ourselves a and, and the people we serve a disservice, I think. Uh, yeah, dignity, I, I didn't mention specifically, but I thank you um, from, from Nick Kukman's uh, input. Fragility and dignity. How, um, how do we help and insist not only on our own dignity, but on the dignity of everyone else? Not in our charity to help the poor and the hungry just perpetuate dependencies. Um, I think the imagination, an alternative to the dominant culture, I think that's that's key to, to what I was trying to say about apocalyptic, that countercultural um, critiquing, critiquing the systems and the powers, and at the same time embodying, living, being uh, the day while it's still night living the day, living the, the light, the justice, the freedom, the hope, the equality of the new world, while the old world lingers and very much clutches at us and uh, pushes us around all the time. Uh, thank you, Chantal. I, I, I just share your other questions about the, ethic, the ethics of gap years and expecting all sorts of volunteerism 
in a, in a situation of dire economic downturn? Um, those are the questions we need to imagine, start reimagining about. Let me stop there. Thanks, Prof. Kripis, can I um, sort of push you a bit more on, on this paradox that, that you referred to, and I think Chantal also referred to. Um, on the one hand, um, we have to take science seriously. Uh, we, we, we work closely with our colleagues, you know, within the natural sciences and even the health and medical sciences. Our uh, colleagues as epidemiologists or virologists. Um, yes, we, and, and I think that's often the charge or the, what's it, unclog, the charge against, accusation against uh, people of faith um, that, um, uh, that, that we do not take um, uh, the, uh, the voices from, from our colleagues in the natural science seriously enough. So that's that's the one side, but but the paradox also that, um, and I, I I want to quote you in a sense we we also should not put our life um, on uh, on the line or our trust in in princes and um, uh, 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 scientists, if if I may paraphrase. Um, did I hear you correctly that? Uh, uh, that uh, you know that paradox is, is crucial as we as we try to uh, make sense uh, of of this moment of this crisis, uh, but also as we start to ask the question how do we um, how do we take this further in terms of uh, our relationships and and also as specifically as theologians um, can 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 you say a few things about that? Um, yeah, thank you, Reggie. I, I think. You know, I mean, if if one adopts a, a praxis cycle or a pastoral circle or some kind of praxis approach, um, the, the the whole question of how do you analyze the context, how do you understand the context, um, more than ever, we are now forced to do that uh, in an interdisciplinary or transdisciplinary way, not to be satisfied with superficial analysis of economy or the health situation or the or the epidemic the pandemic but to to do to do a, to do praxis together with scientists of of other stamps uh, who are not theologically trained who are not perhaps christians or certainly not, you know um, believing or active christians so it is the challenge of not doing religious studies. Uh, th that's that's more um, so-called historical or comparative or phenomenological, but doing th theology be, be, be along with and before we do our biblical interpretation and our, our, hermeneut our exegesis and hermeneutics, the inserting ourselves together with other scientists, natural scientists, uh, and seeing them not as opponents or as distant uh, troublemakers or criti critique, uh, criticizers of religion, but to say we, there's no way that, that we can make a contribution as church, as Christians, as theologians, if we, if we don't do our praxis inserting ourselves with all fellow citizens of, of the country, and analyze what's going on and listening, hearing everyone's stories, not just the scientists, also just the, the traditional healers, the, uh, the old mothers. We, we're gonna need everybody's insight to try not only to, do, to decide what to do about it, but in the first place to understand what has this done to us? What has been happening? What, what is the state of our economy? What is the state of play? And then to read scripture and in, interpret our traditions in the light of, of that shared insertion and shared analysis. And it, it's when you do that analysis and you hear scientists speaking and you hear church people speaking and you hear economists and you realize the, the way in which we often talk against each other um, and don't realize we need each other. Uh, but the, the fragility 
the exposedness, the um, in a sense helplessness of, of humanity in, in the light of uh, something like the pandemic and global warming uh, forces us into a different kind of scientific endeavor, academic endeavor, it seems to me. And I'm maybe in many ways too, too old um, to set in my theological ways to, to really innovate in that regard. But I would hope that we can make space for the students who, who, who grow up around us and, and through, through our in, in input, that they will not just repeat our narrow, narrower theologizing, but that they would step out and step into broader processes in which this paradox can be held together because it, a paradox is, is something that that holds together even though it seems to be contradictory we mustn't let these things um, slip apart and fall apart we have to hold them together and that that's a new journey uh, of of exploring and discovering uh, let, let me stop I wonder, Clippies, uh, Selina Palm, Dr. Palm has, has made a comment in the chat uh, function. I don't know, Selina, if you want to maybe speak to, to this comment uh, um, about, uh, you know, the church's response and, and the kind of, uh, you know, experiences uh, also under uh, Ebola, uh, Selina. Um, hi, everyone. I'm um, sorry, I was putting a comment in the chat because I hadn't thought it all through, but I was I, I was just very struck um, as we did focus group discussions the last few days with people all over the world, specifically about COVID and the church's response. Um, this insight from Liberia who had gone through the Ebola panic and they really stressed um, that the church had learned from some of the things it did wrong there um, around the danger of buying into this sort of fear-based messaging. Um, and we obviously saw that with the HIV pandemic as well, and sort of said that really with COVID, um, they felt that the church in Liberia has really taken this, um, you know, much more positive messaging approach um, and not to be irresponsible around hope, um, but to actually really say that there's an incredibly important role around hope-based messaging um, that, that is needed at this time. Um, and, you know, I think that's a, a real way um, and I'm sure lots of other people have talked about this, but a real way to sort of um, highlight an incredibly important theological role in these times of anxiety and panic um, to not reinforce, I guess, that that tendency to retreat and become afraid and become disconnected. Um, so I do think for our faculty, with our focus on a theology of hope, there's some really interesting ways in which we can continue to sort of make that at the centre of our theology. Yes, thank you. Thanks, uh, Selena, and and some colleagues also, and related to this, some colleagues also um, highlighted this this let's call it this uh, almost message of hope uh, or the good news uh, about grace uh, and um, that that uh, you know we we shouldn't um, be so hard on ourselves, but but we should rather look at at, at ourselves through this this lens of grace. So so thanks for that, also Ian. Uh, and, and, and Robert um, and, and, and Bruce as well. So uh, colleagues, uh, I, I want to also open up if anybody wants to add, uh, you know, your contributions, perhaps you want to ask a question, feel free, you can uh, just uh, raise your hand or and, and, and give your input. Please, you can go ahead. Uh, yes, uh, thank you, Selina. Um, I, uh, I, I think it's extremely important that I, I heard this in um, sort of CNN coverage of the, the responses to the virus in the US, that people who didn't wear masks were saying, look, I'm not going to be live in fear. I'm not going to be controlled. And uh, I, didn't, I didn't sense that in our context, that there was a great deal of fear mongering. Maybe I, I just didn't move in those circles, but I think that's, that's very, very important. Um, I, I was struck by a student early on in March or April who said to me, the, the charismatic Pentecostal members in the townships are saying the church is, uh, churches are cowardly. They should go and worship. They should obey God more than people. They shouldn't obey the government. They should, you know, God will protect us. Um, and how sort of that, it, it, 
you know, finding the, 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 the way there between hubris um, and, uh, and fear, sort of cowering away because of this virus that's sort of messing up our lives and you must be so scared, you must hide in the corner. And on the other hand, a sort of an overconfident, um, and, the, and the, the, the way in the middle, of course, is the way of love. So you, you protect others by wearing a mask, by observing distancing, by staying out of mass meetings and uh, out of closed um, venues. But so I think love, love and dignity. So you are respecting the dignity of yourself and others by loving them and therefore living carefully. But that's not a cowardly option. It's only cowardly uh, if, you, if, if you have a basically hubristic, if you have a basic prideful, arrogant uh, attitude towards life and towards healing. And I think the, the bluff of that health and wealth uh, healing theology has been severely called by the virus. Our other th other theological bluffs have also been called. I mean, I'm not just trying to say they're the only ones who, who are in sort of in trouble. But th thank you, Selena. I, it's important that it must be hope and love that will drive, and faith that will drive, rather than fear. And to the extent that fear has been peddled or consumed by, by Christians and other people of the country, we need to counteract that with that hopeful imagination that Chantal spoke about. Uh, Klubis, can I ask you another thing which, which came out in another conversation with you as well, um, or it's possible that it was one of those radio interviews. Uh, you, you also refer to that, and that's the relationship between church and state. Um, it seems, um, uh, from what I heard, you said that, um, and colleagues apologize for the background noise, uh, it seems that that you said that um, there was uh, also uh, at some point where you wondered um, here the church are now, and it relates to what you just said about um, the church's response to lockdown regulations, uh, not not necessarily the R three, but the lockdown regulations. That um, that there was almost this. Um, <coughs> uh, uh, you can almost uh, accusation again to the church that uh, you you just follow government, you you just follow the state, um, and uh, um, in a sense, uh, what happened to the church's prophetic response or prophetic role vis-à-vis -vis the state um, is this pattern that has been set now in in terms of the lockdown and how we locked the church doors, physical doors not, uh, uh, you know, saying something about um, our, the, the fact that we are too close to the state, too um, almost subservient to the state. Um, can, can you say something about that as well? Because I think it, it also um, ties in with, with you know, uh, the role of, for instance, uh, in particular, a public theology or public kind of theology. Um, do we always uh, have to um just say yes to the to the state uh, you know to these these regulations or um how do we discern at what point do we also uh, say no yeah thank you richie that's a it's a troubling question um i was sitting and wondering yesterday when, when i was also thinking of preparing this um what i talked about the sidelining of the church so there's the bedside, at the bedside of a dying patient. Um, there's there's some, some doctors doing their best, giving oxygen and, and other treatments. And the, the priest, the pastor, the minister is missing. I wonder if we couldn't have done more or can still do more by, by saying that a congregation or a church can, can buy PPE, buy... Um, protective gear for its ministers and uh, and let them work alongside of of doctors now that you have to negotiate with the doctors you don't want to get in the way you don't want to be an obstacle to to their treatment but um in that that big field sort of so-called field was in in cape town i think that's closed now but there were young uh, medical practitioners 
uh, going from bedside to bedside and uh, getting people to speak on iPads to their family. Uh, wh why couldn't ministers have been there, also clad in PPE, thoroughly protected with, with iPads, connecting, helping, working with the medical practitioners to connect people to their families? I, th I think we, we, we might have missed an opportunity um, of incarnation of a ministry of presence and we might still be missing, we, we, we could still do it, of course, the, the, the thing isn't over. It's far from over in, in many senses. Um, so it's not prophetically criticizing uh, the state for locking us out or criticizing the medical doctors for excluding us, but maybe we're a priestly move of saying, well, uh, we, uh, we want to be there. These are our people, we, our people. We are one, we, are, we want to serve, we want to help. This is what the church is sent to do, what the church is all about. Um, I think there were little cracks and openings that we didn't take, that we didn't wedge open because we were maybe a bit too subservient. I don't think it was fear for our own health so much as a, a kind of a subservience of listening to the government and listening to the medical professional, but maybe I'm wrong here. I think we could have done more. Um, I didn't sense that we needed to prophetically critique the government for its lockdown because it was uh, it was an act of love. It was an act of protection. I think that the army uh, soldiers who, who beat people up and even killed people, I mean, that was atrocious and that the SACC and other uh, organizations did critique. But okay, let, let me stop there because I see Christo Tesnar wants to say something. Uh, Christo? Yeah, <coughs> thank you, Dean. Thank you, Clippies. I, I really appreciate it. And it's wonderful to listen to you. And I think you, you made two profound comments, uh, if I can, you know, just reflect on that. The one was that I think the one speaks to the other, but the one was in terms of our positioning um, that, you know, it's not it's not if, we should uh, um, continue or start uh, to think in the line of participating in transdisciplinary uh, uh, um, research and um, position ourselves to engage with other disciplines. It's what 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 this year has taught us is that if we haven't done that yet, uh, we are almost too late in that sense. So. Um, just trying to, to, to again affirm the reality of relationships with other disciplines and not being arrogant, no, not that I say we are all arrogant, I'm just saying that uh, in that sense to to really take hands and build relationships and, and think with other disciplines um, uh, when, we, when we want to address these kind of realities in life. I think that is incredibly important, not only for now, but for the future sort of um, just to make sure that we don't get caught up ourselves in that power game of trying to 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 um, uh, you know do everything we can to to have a better better argument than the rest uh, and or to draw back and do our own thing the second thing I think have we missed opportunity this year as 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 um, as partial caregivers or ministers in the hospital context of course we have I think because we are still stuck, I think, in the old understanding of what it means to 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 live in the presence of of God, but also to be present is not only necessary to be physical present, but there's other ways that we can still make sure that we are present. And you've alluded to the one um, example of of buying PPE and 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 um, participating, but then again, the importance of having relations with other disciplines within that context is so incredibly important that that we we respect and that we engage and um, yeah just to emphasize those two things this has really been a, 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 a again you, you used the word um, in the beginning to say um, well uh, uh, in a sense it's good and bad but I think for for us it is uh, this was a wake up year in many ways uh, positively to try and just reposition ourselves again and. Um, uh, in terms of how we operate. Thank you, Clippis. I appreciate your comments. 
Lopez, I don't know if you want to respond uh, to to that. Thanks, thanks, Crystal. That that was very valuable. No, no I don't want to. Yeah, just to, just to affirm. But what I maybe underplayed in what I said is the um, the way in which churches actually did innovate by being present with people without being physically present. So the um, the online sermons and Bible studies and um, I, I believe that it's the you know visiting even individual visitation of people on Zoom or WhatsApp or so I think somebody called it mouse visitation in, in, to replace house visitation um, and I think that has been extremely important it it shows also our resilience as as congregations to to cross barriers through the use of technology. Um, but I just want to affirm what, what Christo has said. I like that idea of mouse visitation. Uh, <laughs> um, we, we, we should maybe explore that more. Uh, uh, Dr. Malkoto also made this, this uh, I think, important comment that, um, that you know, that it, it, it is ironic that when uh, the churches engage government to, to, let's call it inverted commas, to open up, um, then um, the weird thing is that, um, uh, or the irony was that that members, in fact, uh, didn't attend as, as it was expected. And and there could be many different reasons for that. Um, uh, but but I, I thought that that was an important comment. I don't know, Dr. Markoto, if you want to, to say something more about that. Sipo? Um, good afternoon, colleagues. Yeah, no, Reggie, you just spot on. Uh, but uh, I, I think, um, uh, thank you, Kripus, uh, for, for your presentation. I think uh, the current situation now and, and, and the time during the lockdown, when the, we had a hard lockdown, was that the church felt sidelined, as Kripus is saying. And uh, for me, it was a matter of uh, how do we uh, see our role because this was for me not only a faith issue but also a health issue and we must understand the roles that we we have for me the take was even to my congregants to say we are spiritually there with people we are praying with them and let's give the doctors and the nurses which god gave us uh, and gave wisdom to and they are trained we, they are professionals so our prayers are accompanying them in the journey, going to hospital, dealing with the patients. Because uh, I know in terms of um, uh, uh, counseling, some of the uh, pastors, uh, as soon as they see the patient, they want to touch them, even if you, you teach them. Uh, there are pastors that are really hard in learning to say, but I need to touch the person. The person needs my touch. So those are the things that really concern me during this COVID-19, and they are still a concern. Why I'm saying this, even now, if you look at the reality, most churches, since they are open, uh, many congregants are affected. I know of my church, not in Kayamandi, but in the URC itself, here in Cape Town, there is uh, three people that died of COVID in one of the congregations here. And some of the people are sending me messages to say, but talk to this pastor to close the church. And, and this is really sad. And you can't tell the other colleague to close the church. It's their congregation and they deal with issues in their same in their own way. And they have their own church council that to really monitor whether things are going well or not. So thank you, Clippers, once again. Mm. Thank you. Thank you, Sipo. Uh, uh, Dion, Dion Foster. Thanks, uh, Reggie and, and Clippers. Thanks for a, a very helpful and and very um i think textured and and nuanced reflection that that helps me a great deal one of the things that i've been thinking about um in terms of my own life you know just in terms of my own calling and being a, a minister of a denomination who is seconded by the church to to do the work of theology um, and particularly the discipline within which I work, which is public theology and the context within which we work, where, where there are such apparent and real needs, is how quickly and easily I, I collapse into action. And, and I don't think that's a bad thing. I, I think, you know, there are, there are far worse things to do 
related to inaction. But Clippy's the one thing that's um, struck me a great deal is is how um, the coronavirus pandemic has has shown even in in institutions like our own theological faculties how ill-equipped we are to do the careful work of theology. So the deep work of of reflection on on what it is that we believe, um, you know, the work of meaning making. When I listen to to people, you know, saying things on on TV or posting things on fa Facebook, uh, Christians, pastors, ministers, e even some of our own graduates and students, one can see that, you know, people haven't thought, for example, about the doctrine of creation. You know that that this protein that we are talking about is is a part of creation. They they haven't made sense of of providence. Um, we are still moralizing in in terms of sin. Uh, we haven't thought about anthropology, so things like death, um, you know, Christology, where is Christ? What what does that call us to ecclesiology? So I, I think for me that's that's been one of the things that I've really um I've really, I think, had to confess um that that me personally, I, I feel a, a sense of calling to the work of theology, but because of my own inadequacy sometimes in that regard I've, I found it far easier to just immediately collapse into action so yeah that's not a question really but just a comment and I, I think particularly now as we approach December and this time off I want to take a lot of time just to think and pray and read the scriptures and and read you know theological texts and really journey with family and friends just to to be in companionship as we try to make sense of what we still believe um in the light of this pandemic no thank you dion I, I i think that's that's a very important comment um and uh i think many of us also have that same kind of sense um and and uh, i think you're reminding us of of how crucial how crucial it is for us um even as theologians because uh yes uh, to to use your phrase in a sense you know we've been set aside it's, it's a calling as, as we also reflect here with, amongst ourselves, amongst our, our peers, but also within the broader university context uh, with, with different other colleagues in, in different other spheres, um, it, it, it is crucial that, that, we, that we do take that step back um, with, you know, to just again reaffirm or even readjust um, uh, our call. Uh, so, so thank you, thank you for that. Um, Sipo, the issue of the relationships, you know, amongst ministers and, and with churches, it's, it's not just, I think, a church polity issue, it's also an issue of communion um, uh, and, and, and community, koinonia, um, how, we, how we journey with each other, even sometimes by, by challenging each other. Uh, that, that's a tough one. Uh, Klopis, I'm going to give you, uh, uh, you know, the last opportunity to, to maybe... Uh, say a last few concluding remarks um, and then immediately after that uh, Dr. Shanta Weber will will bring our conversations uh, to a close. Um, so so over to you Clippies and after that uh, Dr. Uh, Shanta Weber. Uh, thank you Reggie. Yes, um, Sipo, it's, it's, a, it's a difficult question. Hey? Um, in a reformed tradition where you uh, at least in theory in theory you have a flat structure you don't have a bishop over um, a minister or a congregation who can sort of give instructions and even in episcopal churches it's not as simple as just that but um yeah if if a uh, if something goes wrong in a in a neighboring congregation and uh, it's because they are worshiping together people are contracting the virus and dying as a result. Um, I mean, the, the, it, then it is a real issue, hey, in terms of uh, calling colleagues to account, um, Matthew 18 or whatever, saying, are, are you, do you really think this is wise? Of course, that, that's now, if, if you can, not prove, but if it's, it's clear that people are contracting the virus through the worship services, one well, can probably never quite prove that, but um, I, I think it's, it's a real challenge. A presbytery in the Reformed tradition should be a kind of a peer review 
mechanism where we peer over each other's shoulders uh, and and uh, help and challenge sometimes each other in terms of our commitments that we've made. But uh, the church should not do harm. And, and if its worship does, then it must reform, then it must change. And then we must call each other to that uh, better way, uh, even if it, it makes one unpopular at times. But uh, Dion, I, I agree with you. Um, in many ways, we are caught out theologically, um, reflecting on the nature of evil. Um, so, so what is, is, is a virus, the existence of a virus, is that the will of God? Is it just part of nature? Is it because there are too many people on earth? Some relatives of mine have said, well, you see, this is just the eating back. There are too many people on earth. The, the earth cannot sustain so many human beings. So humans as a kind of an infection uh, of the earth, it's a, it's a, a growth that has covered the whole uh, surface of, of, the, of, the, of the planet. Now the other living beings on the planet sort of strike back and say, there's too many of you guys. Um, that's sort of a, a non-theological, a non-believing sort of attitude of some, some scientists. But the question of ecology and um, the, the doctrine of creation. So th this is a rough, this is a wild horse where we have saddled hey, the earth, the hurricanes and uh, earthquakes. It's not a comfortable, stable uh, planet we, we're riding on. This little spaceship with its limited resources is a shaky one. So what does that mean theologically um, in terms of creation, in terms of providence, in terms of evil? And so how we position ourselves in relation to all of this. Um, I, th I think it's uh, very challenging and very, very important questions. And we, we need to do deeper theological thinking, uh, Dion. I, I agree with you. I also run back to my books, and I hope all of us will do that. And not just books, also the wisdom of, of members of the church who have often not spoken and have certainly not written but the wisdom of African traditions, African Christian traditions as well, African indigenous churches quite often. We need to listen very, very, very widely to, uh, to find a way through, to find a way forward. Thank you very much for, for having me. Yes, thank you, Prof. From our side as a faculty, we really want to thank you for opening up the discussion. Uh, I don't think the intention was ever to to end it in, in an hour. And as we can hear from varying voices, uh, colleagues are grappling with different parts of this. And I think, you know, it's very interesting. I, I would like to know um, in terms of the imagination, the creativity part, many of us are attending and listening to these different talks, um, exhausted uh, and yeah, just ready to end. So I'd wonder how, how we'd reflect on what we've heard even today uh, after resting for a bit. Um, would we be sharing the same things? Would we be, you know, engaging in the same manner? But yeah, uh, so many things to, to think through, but it, it also highlights these varying tensions that we have. And so from our side, Prof, thank you very much for joining us and thank you to who has made the effort to, to be with us. Um, colleagues, just to remind you that all these sessions have been recorded. So if you would like to hear them again when your brain is clearer and when you have done some more personal uh, exploration and discovery, please just check in with, with the Dean. So with that, we say thank you and goodbye. goodbye. Thank you, colleagues. Thank you, Clippies. Appreciate. Thank you, colleagues. Thank you, Dr. Weber. Well. Have, a, have a wonderful day.